a fighter? <laughs> Are you a good fighter? And maybe you find something unusual with this picture because with boxing gloves normally you don't find the suit and the tie behind. But it is there to remind us that whether you are a businessman, a mother, a domestic helper, an engineer, any, anything, a teacher, uh, asylum seeker, uh, whatever you are in, in, in the society, if you are a Christian, you must be a fighter. Amen? I think if you are from the Philippines, you will know the next person I want to, uh, to introduce to you this morning, the Mr. Pac-Man. Yes, Mr. Pac-Man. He is so, such a great, not only a great boxer, a world-class uh, boxer and a champion and a celebrity in the world, but also someone who has met Jesus Christ and is not afraid not only to to be a fighter in life because he had to come from poverty to the place where he is. A true fighting is way up, but he gives glory to God. I want to let the people know that there is a God who can raise someone from nothing into something, and that's me. I came from nothing into something, and I owe everything to God. He gave me this blessing. It's all credit to the Lord. If you do any search, on the internet or YouTube or uh, uh, Pinterest or whatever about the Pac-Man, you will find a lot of quotes. And many of these quotes are giving glory to God. So we need to pray for people like him because being such a celebrity, having access to the presidents of nations and stars in Las Vegas and having so much wealth and everything, you know, when you are elevated at that level as Christians, if you fall, you fall from up high. And it can be very destructive for the wave that you will, will, you will bring. So we need to, to pray for people like him because he is in a position of great influence for God. So we need to sustain as a church and love for him. And we have a short videos where he share his bits, of, bits and pieces of his testimony. Well, um, four years ago, uh, before, before that, my life is, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm not really, it's like empty, uh, empty, my life is empty, although I have money, I have, uh, you know, I can do whatever I want, but it's kind of uh, empty in my heart, but there's a time come that, you know, uh, actually I, I can say this, the Lord has changed my heart, mm. Mm. the Lord changed my heart, you know, my experience in life, uh, this is, uh, I'm excited to share to everybody, that I had experience to hear the voice of God and when I hear the voice of God I'm just like melting I'm just I, I feel like dying wow yeah. I was in the middle of the forest and kneeling and crying and asking for forgiveness to the Lord and Lord forgive me and then and then there's a light a, a very uh, uh, white light and like like a sun I'm very white and then I, I want to, to look up and, and look the, the light but I cannot, um, you know, I cannot uh, raise my head wow. and I'm, I'm, I'm kneeling and bowing, face on the ground and crying to the Lord, Lord forgive me and then after that I hear the voice of God and son why you, why you leave me, why you keep away from me mm. because in that time um, I always, you know, I love partying, gambling, womanizing, everything. You know, when, when God changed my heart, I realized those things that, you know, I'm, if I, I died five years ago or six years ago, I'm pretty sure I'm not, in, I'm not going to, to heaven. Wow. I'm, I'm going to hell. We, we can see the fruits of your life. Wow. That's the most important thing. That's the most important relationship to the Lord. And, and the Bible says, remember this, the Bible says, there is no other way of salvation. Either whatever language you have, the, the Lord Jesus declared it. There is no other way of salvation only through Jesus Christ. Either you believe or not. If you believe, you will be saved. If you don't, you don't have salvation. Because it's the only way 
He is the truth in the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Now, when I'm eager to read the Bible, when I, read, when I understand, the, after one week reading the Bible, reading every day, I like, when I woke up morning, I read the Bible, and then evening before I sleep, I read the Bible, and then after one week reading, I understand the Word now. Wow. And here's the things. When I understand the Word, reading the Bible, so I feel like I'm crying, crying. I'm not worthy in your in your in your sight. I'm not worthy. Then this crying Lord, and then just guide me. And Lord, I am not a, a, a I mean degree holder person, but Lord, whatever you want me to do, wow. your will be done. Wow. Because my life is nothing, nothing. I surrender to you, my life, Lord. Now I surrender to you, my life. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Here is a fighter who is fighting for God. Amen? Hopefully you will go on and go on. The next slide is a Psalm 18. It's a promise for each and every one of us without exception. God is saying to you, you equip me with strength for the battle. Do you have a battle to fight today? Are you fighting anything or is there any battle that could come eventually in front of you? All sorts of battle. Battle comes in all formats, uh, all sorts of difficulties. Uh, today we are going to talk about some type of battle in church history, but battle comes in two individuals at different level. Uh, if you are in the business, they come in business. If you are in the family, they come in family format. Uh, whatever it is, it, it comes with money, it comes with health, it comes with people against us. It, it comes from enemies, it comes from inside, outside, it comes on all sorts of... Uh, but God says that He is equipping us with the strength that we will need for any battle, whatever battle. Can you tell your neighbor, uh, you are equipped for the battle? You are equipped for the battle, for the strength that God has given to you. And look, uh, look at the people who are against you. You made those who rise against me sink under me. That's the history of the church. Whether you are a businessman, a mother, a pastor, whatever you are in society, every Christian must learn to fight. Amen? Amen. Tell your neighbor, are you a fighter? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Because you must, you must be a fighter. You must be a fighter. Every Christian has to be a fighter. And this is this is the theme of the history of the church. Since the birth of the church, since Pentecostal, until now, there's an ongoing battle. And this is the battle in church history. One definition that I have found this week about church history, it's like a, a battle for the Bible. The next slide. The definition of church history, a battle for the Bible. And this is what church history is all about. The Bible did not exist. And the Bible is filling our bookshelves today everywhere. All over the world we have Bibles translated in hundreds of languages at the time. Church history is an account of more than 2,000 year war between Oppositions and persecution and expansion. Sometimes it went great, sometimes it backslid and it was dark ages and everything. Heresies, false teaching just came out and then some theologian came and fought against that and all this. So 2,000 years against the word of God to be spread. There was a lot of ignorance in the world before. We have many lessons from uh, church history that we need that we need to learn. Let me read to you something uh, as we before we go any further with the, the scriptures. I want to talk to you about some uh, pre-reformations Bible pioneers. You can see here be besides me, I have many Bibles. <laughs> this one I'm not even sure what it is. Let me see. Oh, looks like Russian, or maybe it's Mongolian, Russians, Indonesians. OK. 
Okay, Al Kitab, Holy Bible, easy. Huh? La Sainte Bible, okay. Arabic. Yeah, we have all of this here in Lighthouse. Amen. Shenjing. Ang Batong Mayong Balita Biblia. We even have the amplified, simplified, amplified, concise, uh, modern, easy to read, uh, you know, whatever it is. We have so many Bibles. But did you know that it was not like that? And today we have access to all of this. The Christian gospel from the time of Jesus was meant to be to the whole world. But how was it going to be transmitted to the world at the time? You know, one of the joy of preaching is studying and preparing because you come in contact with all sorts of uh, materials and study and everything and I wish I would do even much, much more of that. In the third century after Jesus Christ, the, the first Christ, official Christian nations was uh, Armenia. Uh, in 390, uh, the first Armenian alphabet now, now think, think for a moment. In that time, many of the nations did not have an alphabet. How can you read? Now, okay, you all went to kindergarten or you know primary school says A, B, C, A, Papa, A, Ball. This is the A can be pronounced this way, can be pronounced that way, and this word and that word. And we have learned to read and we have access to the printed Word of God. Aren't you blessed? In 300, most of the nations did not have a written language. It's hard to imagine for us because we don't know that. We've never experienced that. Whether country you have coming from, everybody in this room here, from Benguet, from Togo, from Quebec, from uh, the, the, the furthest place of England, wherever you are coming from, from Hong Kong, China, you have learned. In Chinese, po, po, fo, you learn the alphabet in Chinese. And you learn the Chinese characters, the stroke, and dian, pie, na, and all of this. You learned all of these strokes. Amen? We have learned to read. We have learned to understand and communicate. And 300, there was not in Armenia. They became Christians by the, the preaching, but they couldn't read the word of God. So the first, an Armenian slave woman brought the gospel message to Georgia and Russia. They didn't have also their own language. So as Christianity spread to the borders of the Roman empires, translations were made into language of barbarian tribes. That's what, that's what it is. Often the translator would first have to develop an alphabet. What kind of alphabet? Okay, we have ABC or you know, you have the Cyrillic language and everything for the people who didn't have enough. Then they had to, to, to teach that uh, alphabet to teach that language and everything. And then they had to translate the text, the holy text of the Bible into these uh, alphabet, these new words, these new languages, so that Christianity could uh, be uh, promoted and expanded all over, all over the world. Imagine that. This is what we have today. Your, how many Bibles do you have in your house? I, 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 cannot, I, I'm, I cannot even count mine. I have so many. How many? You're only four. That's not so many. I, 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 honestly, I have more than 20 to 30 Bibles, I think, in my home, for sure. Study Bibles in French and English and Chinese and Spanish. Uh, I have a, a lot of Bibles of all sorts. Small, small fonts, big fonts, uh, re cross-reference, no cross-reference. Uh, for children, because we have the children Bible stories for children and everything. We have so, so many, so many. The earliest written were in Germanic language. Is the center of Europe. Uh, 
were the fragments that uh, the Bible translated by Ulfilas in the fourth centuries. Ulfilas' grandparents had been Christians in modern Turkey. And then you, you read through the church history, it, like little dark, obscure uh, stories about people insignificant, just a Christian, a grandfather somewhere who has been touched by the power of God. And this simple man did something wonderful. He, he educated someone. He translated the Bible. He made it available. And they didn't have a press at the time. So they had to be written in, in parchments and documents. Can imagine how privileged this is to be cherished. Hello? Your Bible. It is to be cherished. Uh, it, it is sad. I, I was reading through these materials this week. I think it is sad. And I am the first to be guilty that many times I don't carry my printed Bible anymore with me because I have this one here. And it is so easy. I can change the language, the Bible version, so just by, by clicking and all this. But I am a bit, when I was reading this week and preparing for this morning, I was a bit sad. Something is not. And I'm, I'm happy because my wife is, you know, when you did the Word and Spirit studies, every Saturday she spent so many hours sitting at the kitchen table with many study Bibles, and she was reading with real printed Bibles, you know, not with uh, electronic one and everything, but uh, studying and preparing so that the Bible study on Sunday morning that you share together, she could participate well. So, so people are like this. And uh, in the ninth century, uh, Christian missionaries uh, brought the Cyrillic alphabet. The Cyrillic alphabet is the character of uh, some uh, former uh, Russian uh, countries, Cyrillic alphabets and everything. Uh, Cyril and Methodius from Thessalonica. You see, so you find in the Bible, Paul brought the Bible to Thessalonica and he says, you are doing so well, you are sp you're spreading faith and your faith is being known all over the world. And then you find here in the ninth century that these guys are from Thessalonica and they brought the gospel and Cyrillic language, which was nothing to do with their language. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. And then you, you go on with these, in the medieval church time, Medieval is like the dark ages. That's really an ugly time to be. There was a, a lot of uh, bad stuff happening in this time, in this generation. It was a time of darkness, intellectual darkness, spiritual darkness and everything. The clergy was very powerful politically and they were controlling and they were forbidding the non-authorized version of the, of the Bible that only a few in the clergy would have in all of this. And not only that, but much of the population could not read. So books were very, very rare. So anyway, and then you, you come a little bit later to uh, a group of Christians in the 12th century in France, Peter Waldo, uh, they, they created the Waldensians. And they were the first to demand a Bible study for the common people in the time. And then it went to other part of Germany and then some scholars, John Wycliffe, you know the name, Wycliffe is important because we have today the Wycliffe Organization, translator of the Bible. But Wycliffe at that time was a man, a priest of the Catholic Church in England who came against the Pope and against selling indulgences and he came very strong and he asked for a Bible and he wrote the first English Bible uh, available and it was forbidden, of course it was not uh, allowed for him and they, they persecuted him very much. Having translation of the scriptures was banned by the church and many were punished for having a Bible in their own language. These were the dark days. Just just like Amos the prophet says, there would be famine for hearing the word of the Lord. That was a very dark time in the Bible. So today, I'm saying that to, to bring to your attention how church history is important to you and to me. Because without them, we don't have that. You know, we have Lighthouse, you have a wonderful place to praise and worship and read the Bible and be educated in the Bible, but before us, and sometimes, you know, the modern church, we think we are, uh, in French, we see the, 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 the nombre du monde, like the, the, 
how do you call it the how do you call that no no the the bottom the bottom belly button okay that we are we are the belly button you know and uh we are so important that we we are smarter in our generation that we have invented everything that we are you know but this is not true we we were given this by somebody who fought somebody fought for their life somebody gave their life somebody suffered for us and they were persecuted some events in this story that we don't know how that is mark the few, your life when the Ottoman Empire were conquering Europe, they had already uh, captured um, uh, the Middle East, North Africa, Spain, Southern Italy, and they were invading uh, Europe by both sides, from the Eastern Europe, and then they were in Spain and Italy, and they were coming. This is a French man, Charles Martel, Charles Martel, who actually, with his knights, they fought uh, for six or seven days a battle to stop the invasions of that. Without them, Europe would have been Muslim and Christianity would have been banished and everything. And uh, the Christianity that you and I have today comes from Europe. Rome, England, Germany, all the, the, the reformations, everything, it comes from that. Imagine without this battle here where someone stood and fought against evil the enemies of God and attack one more attack against the Bible and the Word of God we would not be here today so events and history have marked your life and 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 my life and this is why we are standing here today we must be uh, thankful grateful and hold on to our Bible with so much respect and cherish it, desire it, uh, feed ourselves with it, not neglect it because it is so, so precious. And the battle of the gospel is still going on. So you and I, in this generation, we are called to be fighter and stand. And there are the always, always we will have there are three areas the church will always fight for, always fought for. Martyrdom, the persecution, direct attack against, to destroy, to remove. And have you noticed in the last few years how much it has been increasing with ISIS, with, uh, you know, uh, Boko Haram and many, many Muslims, extremists, even in the, in India also, and the extremists here and extremists there. And before even this generation, just if you go back just like 20, 30, 40 years uh, before that, you have the uh, communist uh, countries in Albania, they were boasting at one time to have not a single Christian the whole country. That was the pride of that country. And people were smuggling the Bible, trying to enter, trying to have underground uh, church. And so that's not so, so long ago. We're talking like in the 1900s, uh, uh, mid, mid 1900s. We're not talking long history. But throughout ages, these horrible persecutions have always been there. So persecutions, martyrdom, the second attack and the fight that we need to hold on is to, about apologetics, the defense of the faith, the theology, the truth under attack, and all the confusions, the uh, uh, extreme teaching of that side or on that side. And we need, and we had from the father of the church, uh, very, very important men that, that fought, that fought for us. Uh, do I have it with me here? Oh, I don't have it. Anyway. I have so many notes. <laughs> so, so the second point is the defense of the faith, the keeping of the truth, the fighting for the truth that we have received, the apostolic message that is always endangered to be corrupt and, and transformed. And the other one is evangelism or the spreading, the mission. You know, when William Carey, the father of modern mission, uh, wanted to, to bring the gospel. At that time, they didn't have uh, a mission-minded view in the church. They, they, they were so uh, Calvinistic in their teaching that the, the mentality of the time was, if God wants to save the pagan, he is sovereign, he will save it. In other words, 
whether you go or don't go, do or don't do anything, it's not about you. It's about the sovereignty of God, but into an extreme. And William Carey confronted these ideas, and it was that at the time when the expansions of the British Empire were uh, colonizing and sending the, the commercial uh, ships, you know, all over the world, and just following that following in the, the footsteps of William Carey, the father of modern missions. And uh, they got onto these ships and they went onto these most horrible place on the face of the world and they shared the gospel. Before that, and the uh, re uh, reformations and the Swiss reformations, the Moravians, the Moravians gave their life. They are a like, very obscure group. If you have not studied the church history, you don't have never heard about them. But they went to the furthest islands in the world and they sent missionaries. At, and these years was very, very unknown concept. They were very mission, uh, mission minded at the time. So today you and I, we stand here in Hong Kong. Most of us come from other countries and we have the word of God freely in our, in our hands. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. And this is why we need to fight just like they did. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. In Colossians, we find in Colossians chapter 1, and I want to look at more mainly at verse 23. Uh, we, we have the, I think, uh, 21 to 23, but I want to insist on verse 23. It says, before we were alienated from God, God reconciled us through the physical body, through the death of Jesus Christ, present us holy in His sight. If you continue in your faith, if you continue in your faith is an expression of fight, standing, continuing, striving, uh, uh, resisting, fighting. Th th these are uh, synonyms. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm and do not move from the hope held in the gospel. And that time, the gospel was under attack. And you had to pay a price, and you had to suffer to remain a Christian. So when Paul says, if you continue in your faith, many times for us we interpret it like you can lose your salvation. And it's not the context of that. The context of that was in Colossians, they had cults. They had the Gnostics. They were developing another gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were contradicting the basic truths about Christianity, is humanity, is divinity. That, that's why Paul says that we were reconciled through the Christ physical body through death. So he was truly dead and he had a body just like a man. He was not only a spirit having a seemingly uh, uh, shape of a man. He was a, a man and he was, he was God. So you have here the defense of the faith. Then you have the call to, that comes to all generation of Christians. If you continue in whatever time you are, and in our time, in this society of uh, hedonistic society, a society that is based very much on the self-pleasure. If you want to do it, do it. Get whatever you want. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. Just do it, you know, and everything. That, that society of self gratifications of me first, my rights, my body, my whatever it is. This is a dangerous attack against us. Sometimes it is, my life is in danger because someone wants to kill me, murder me, torture me. But here sometimes in our generation is like we are sleeping because we are living so much based on self and our wealth and our acquisitions of possessions that we forget what people in the church before us you know, in the times of the catacomb, there was a time where they didn't have a balanced understanding of scriptures. And they were at one point, you know, w when there is a lot of darkness and evil, God is so merciful that sometimes he will bring divine interventions. And there were a lot of miracles and healings and supernatural events happening in the catacombs at the same time. Because God had to 
do something for them because it was so horrible what they were going through. That led to some people kind of over admiring uh, these people who were in prison and who had died to a point of praying the bones, the bones of the dead, to, to touch the bones so that they could receive some sorts of healing and, and things like that. So there was a time in the, in the church, uh, very confusing. And uh, these people were overemphasizing, you know, these uh, people. And some people, they ran to suffer. They wanted the privilege of dying for their faith. Not only they, had, they were captured and put with the lions, but it, there was a time where suffering was, I want to suffer for Christ. I want to be eaten by the lion. I, I, I want to be thrown in the dungeon. I, I want to be tortured and all of this. And some of the bishop of the time had to put a stop on that. Say, whoa, whoa, you are misinterpreting some things. You don't have to go in that, that route. Be but because of the lack of teaching and uh, overemphasizing or something. But what I want to say is that suffering has always been part of the New Testament. It's never been hidden like, believe in Jesus and all your problems are finished. It's never been the message of the New Testament. Suffering has always been part of that. So that's why Paul says to all generation Christians, if you continue in your faith, whether it is an easy time, whether it is a persecution, whether it is a time of suffering and pain, whether it is a climate of injustice. There's a lot of people in modern society today we, we scream for justice, 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 justice. And you know, and the most unjust time, and the most horrible society that the world has ever known, there were Christians who were fighting for the word of God. Always, always fighting and says establish and firm and do not move from the hope held in the gospel. How, how, much, how much are we holding on really, truly, weekly, monthly, daily? Uh, how much are we affected by the hope held in the gospel? Really? Many of us, we are very much into the day-to-day -day material uh, activities and we are kind of overwhelmed by the stress of work and everything. But the hope held of the gospel has been the core motivations of the church, the strength. If I die today, I'm with Jesus today. Amen. They, they, this was the truth that they were having at that time. And if you go on, Paul talks in the verse 24 to 27 about his calling and that he is a servant or a diaconia commissioned by God himself to present to you the word of God in its fullness. And that zeal, that spirit that motivated Paul to cover by foot, by ship, uh, by shipwreck, being beaten, left for dead and everything, to share that gospel is the same Spirit of God that is given from generation to generation. You will receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You, your children, and those who are afar, as long as the Lord is calling people. Generation after generation, we receive the same spirits. And that's why when a time when it seems that they we're going through a decline, the Holy Spirit will uh, take hold of some individual somewhere. Because God is the God of history. God is the one who says, I will build my church. And what is the church to God? What is the role of the church? What are the function of the church? Is to be the same today. Is to be the same. The purpose of the church in the book of Acts is the, it's meant to be the same as it is today. There's no, no difference. So whatever we do, whether it's the Global Outreach Day uh, uh, conference for training uh, workers in the Philippines or in Bangladesh in November or whatever it is that we are doing, it must always be brought into the, the center, the core value of what Jesus Christ is about and what the saints of the Old Testament and the saints of the New Testament and the church history have left to us. Amen?
Verse 28 to 29, He is the one we proclaim, warning, teaching with wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. There are very many wonderful uh, ex expression and Greek in this in this sentence o over there. It's a very powerful uh, sentence because it talks about the energia of the Holy Spirit, the inner working of the Holy Spirit, and it talks about the dunamis power that Christ provides, the miraculous energy and power that God is is given. So, what the church has to fight with to be overcomer from generation to generation. It's that power we are talking, says. We meet Paul the fighter. I strenuously contend. And that word here is the word agonizomai. You know agony? The agony of the Christ Jesus is often a word related to the passion, the suffering, the, the, the contempt. Tending of Jesus Christ, going through that week of suffering, facing the cross ahead reluctantly because of the pain and the suffering, but with his willingness to do it to the end and accomplish his mission, that's the agony of Jesus Christ. So this is a verb made with the word agony, agonizomai, the, the, the contending of athletes, the fighting of Pacquiao to win the, 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 the fight and everything, the running to the end, whether it is a marathon, to be able to finish the line or the sprint, to run the faster, whatever sports discipline you have, it's the fighting, it's that contending, it's that uh, doing your best to get it done. And that is the calling to all generation Christians. And many times we put it aside and we just like do nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, 27. Some verses quickly that stress these agonizomai uh, and it or the agony. I do not rain, run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body. I kept it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. I keep it, I agonizomai, I, I fight with my fist that hits and accomplish something. For endurance and patience, Hebrew chapter 12, verse one and two. Being surrounded by such a cloud of witness, we, we, we've talked a bit about clouds of witness, all those in church history that have contributed to fight the fight for the word of God and the church so that we can have it today, we can continue on with them. We have a cloud of witness, so with them, this cloud of witness, let us, this is a call to all of us, Set aside everything that distracts us and let us run with endurance the agony. That is this one, looking to Jesus. Jesus done it before us. Jesus shown us that he, he, he was looking at the pain and the suffering and he was willing to do it to the end because he saw the end result. The end result is you and I, we were saved and we could belong to, to him. Number three, prayer. Epaphras, who is one of you, and the servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. He is always wrestling or struggling or agonizomai and prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Prayer, prayer. You see, the same goal that we read that Paul was fighting for, contending strenuously, we find that Epaphras was doing it in prayer. So sometimes prayer sometimes action, ministering, but we have to do it with all the strength that we have. First Timothy 6, 11 and 12, a verse that we use for you when you are water baptized. Men of God or women of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Agonizomai, the agony of the faith. Keep your faith, whatever happened, fight for your faith. Take all of eternal life. You have been called 
for eternal life and you have made a confession you have declared that you believe Jesus Christ that you believe in it, the gift of eternal life that you live for it you have declared it and because you have declared it you become enemy number one of Satan enemy number one of all the enemies of God and your declaration of faith is going to come under attack sooner or later and under many many formats you go to work going to be under attack and your family is going to be attacked with your neighbors is going to be attacked your faith is going to be attacked your your desire to live for God your integrity your 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 living for Christ like Christ is going to come under attack so that you have to quit so that you can be discouraged so that you can fall Paul says I have fought the good fight I finished the race I finished it I completed it. I came to the end of the line. The marathon of faith. I kept the faith. And in closing, for your family or for the next generation, why is church history so important? Number one, because your children and the next generation must know that Christianity is a historical faith. It's not the Chronicle of Narnia. It's not the Lord of the Rings. It's not Robinson Crusoe on this island. It is a, a true fact and history. So by looking in history through the Bible and then post-Bible, through post-apostolic time, you find that what we are today is part of history. Your foundation what you have today has been given to you, passed on from generation by people who suffered and fought all along. Number two, because they must know that the Bible is worth dying for. The history of the church is the battle for the Bible. It is worth dying for. A lot of people died. Many people died for the Bible and your language and their language and any language. Many people died to share it and to bring it in all of this. Our Bibles, our English translation did not come cheap. Men and women were imprisoned, beaten, killed. Do you know about William Tyndale? Many of you maybe have heard the name of William Tyndale. He is called the father of the English Bible. Remember I told you before Wycliffe was one priest in the Catholic Church in England who gave the first English Bible and has been persecuted later on? Back in the 14th century, John Wycliffe was the first to make an English translation of the Bible. That was way before the printing press and copies had to be handwritten. The church had banned the unauthorized translation of the Bible into English because it was only in Latin that it existed and it was under the control of a few of the clergy. A hundred years later, William Tyndale had the desire to make the Bible available to people, common people in England. He studied at Oxford and Cambridge and he was very highly educated. And many times he met with the, the clergy of the time and he was uh, amazed of the ignorance of the uh, biblical ignorance of the clergy, of the priest. One time he told the priest, if God, the Tyndale speaking, if God spare my life, give me time, I will cause a boy that drive the plow, that is plowing the field like a farmer, little farmer boy, that will, sh that will know more the scriptures than you do. He's talking to a priest of the time, a clergy, an authority. He says, if God give me years, if God give me time, I will cause a little farmer boy to know more about God than you do, you priest. That's what Tyndale was about. So it was a nice dream, but how was he going to translate the Bible into English? It was illegal. He asked the permission to a bishop of the time, a high authority in the church, but it, it was not granted to him. So he had to run and move to Europe in hiding. You can imagine smuggling Bible, 
hiding to translate the Bible. He did it. So he moved to Europe to complete his translation. And then they printed a few and smuggled it into China. He found he founded a way to uh, the time the printed uh, book existed. In 1524, he went to Germany, first in Hamburg, where you work on the New Testament, and then Cologne. Is it where you live? Cologne? Is that near? Yeah, you see? William Tendale went to your place. <laughs> and then he found a printer and he printed the work. But people, opponents to the Reformation, came against him and they destroyed the print and all the work. So they only could save some copies. I think a few 6,000 copies were printed and smuggled into English. See, for me, when I read a story like that, it touched me deeply because I moved to Hong Kong to be a Bible smuggler the, to, to China. And I see the, the same things that they describe here. I found the same thing in China at the time. The fear of getting the Bible and trying to arrest people, put people in prison, punish them, beat them, and all of this. So I have a, a connection with, with Tendale, even though his work is so much more important than what we did. But Tendale sent these copies. Then, the, later on, with these copies, some of the clergy in England deceased these Bibles, and deceased people who were smuggling these Bibles, and they asked to buy these Bibles. So they purchased, and they gave money for it. So the money was given back to Tyndale, who printed better, improved versions of the Bible with that. See how the devil is trying and God is wisest. So Tyndale used the money that the clergy but to remove this, and the clergy burned the Bibles in a big, big uh, public stand to show this is really serious things. Uh, King Henry VII invited Tyndale uh, to go back to England, but uh, Tyndale says, I will not go back to Tyndale until the king allowed to have Bibles for all the common people over there. So Tyndale refused. And then later on, the king's agents searched all over Europe to find him. They found him, uh, 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 an Englishman who pretended to be his friend, turned him over to the authorities. So they brought him back. The king promised protection, but they didn't keep their word. They strangled him, and they burnt him to the stake. His last prayer was, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. And not many, many years later, the next king, Henry VIII, is the one who asked that the English Bible be given to every household in England, Tyndale. What you have is very precious. It has to be cherished. It has to be hidden in your heart. It has to be fought for, spread, defended, loved, to educate yourself, educate the next generation, fulfill the purpose of the church why we exist. It's the fight for the word of God. Without it, we wouldn't know anything about anything. Amen. Hallelujah. Another reason is that the next generation will know that theology is important. Theology is the science, the, the study of knowing God, knowing the Word of God, knowing what's the truth, that theology is important, so that we can also learn about the important theology and who have marked the, the church, the truth that we are sharing today, that we are believing, that we are discussing. You know, and that this theology also explains why this church practices this style. Why that church emphasizes that aspect instead. Different churches, you know, in Hong Kong, we have the international church, we meet together, but we are so different. And in many ways, we believe things that are non-essential, that are not so... 
But you know, you have the Wesleyan, the Methodist pastor here that we are close friend. He went through a cancer of the, of the tongue last year. We prayed together. The Anglican pastor that is building this wonderful sanctuary here at St. Andrew's Church. It will be a, a pioneer church in Hong Kong, one of the strong hold of Hong Kong here. And we pray together, different style. And we come from different perspectives of studies. By teaching our children and by learning about this theology and we, we sort it out. We kind of accept to disagree. We agree to disagree in certain ways and to be, you know, one in Jesus Christ and everything. Also, children in the next generation must know that, see and understand that we are part of Christ's church through the ages, that what we are today in 2015 here in Hong Kong, our local church lighthouse is part of the big picture, of the big church of God, the universal church, or the true Catholic church. You know the word Catholic means universal. When we say the Catholic church, it's not Roman Catholic. This is Roman Catholic. Catholic church was the first church of the apostles when it started to spread in the kingdom. It's a universal body of Christ made of all the uh, local churches of all over the world, believers in Christ Jesus. We are the Catholic Church. We are part of it. In 2015, in our generation, you and I, we are called to the same fight. Fight for the Word of God in my generation, in my situation. So whether you are a mother, or a businessman, maybe Andreas, you can put the last, the last slide. Or uh, anybody, an engineer, an architect, anything. You are called to be a fighter. And God has promised that he will equip you for the battle with his own strength. And that is what gives us the, the hope and the desire to uh, continue as long. If you are a Christian, you have to be a fighter. Just like Pac-Man. Yes. The fight for the word of God is still going on today. This generation needs to be, you know we are in the most, well maybe not the most because we talked about worse than this, but this, this generation, the young, young children that are growing now, they do not know the word of the, the Lord like our generation had. If you were raised in England, in the 70s, 80s, or whatever, even before, just by being born there, you, you would know God. If you were born in the Philippines, you know God because you were taught God. In my place in Canada and Quebec, we were told everything. God is a spirit. There's a trinity. You know, God, Jesus died for the sins of the world. Like we, we, we grew up with that. No more, this generation. So we have a great great challenge before us to be a fighter is to bring back the word of God, to fight for the word of God in this young generation that have not heard about how wonderful Jesus Christ is. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Are you ready to be a fighter? Yes. Praise God. Praise God. God wants you to be a fighter. Can I invite you to stand? Hallelujah. May I sing a song?